Best-selling author Jonathan Evison is known for writing novels featuring unforgettable characters tackling difficult challenges. His latest novel is called Lawn Boy. It spotlights a young landscaper's dream of the American dream and his quest for that. It takes on issues of poverty, race, and class. The book is set in western Washington, and not surprisingly, the author comes from the Olympic Peninsula. Please welcome Jonathan Evison. It's so good to have Thanks you here. Thanks for having me. Oh, my I God. After book. Ron, I'm so glad this isn't a job interview. <laughs> it's not. All we of a sudden, a TV relax. interview sounds easy. <laughs> it does. I was very I tense. thought these matched, for instance, <laughs> in the dark at 745, and turns out they're not even close. It's all good. It is all good. Um, I loved this book. I really loved this well, book, so and much. I felt very attached to Mike Munoz, our, our, our main character. Um, and you wrote with great, great authenticity about what the experience is of being working poor. Um, was that on purpose, or did that just happen to be who Mike was as he came out of your imagination? Well, kind of me, too. I mean, I, 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 before I was a best-selling novelist, I was broke my whole life. I was raised by a single mom of four. Yeah. She worked two jobs. I grew up in libraries, you know, taking naps on the quilted uh, quilted sofas. And um, I, I, I've always wanted to write a novel about class in America, and I always kind of thought I'd take more of a broader tact, you know, write a multi-generational saga across mm -hmm. time and space. But then I, I came upon Mike's voice. Um, he started to be my muse. I, I had ended up as a landscaper by default in my mid-30s. It was one of a string of, an endless string of jobs. Like, I'm not a college guy. I dropped out of a few community colleges, but, you know, I'd sorted Rotten Tomatoes. I've telemarketed sunglasses. I've worked the car lots. Uh, uh, name it. I've done check gas meters. I've been a bartender, yeah. a waiter. Every 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 kind of manual labor job you can think of. And um, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, the landscaping part is a part of me. And uh, I just, it just feels so topical right now. Uh, because there's more working poor than there's ever been. I mean, right. you just, uh, uh, you know, and, and I don't think people realize it in their sort of wealthy enclaves or their comfortable enclaves. I mean, I, it's hard not to notice when you drive down the street and there's a tent city everywhere. Right. But uh, I mean, people don't understand. I don't think that, uh, you know, there's adjunct professors and chefs, you know, working two jobs, living in their car right now. And I mean, you know, something we need to talk about. So, uh, you know, I, I, I like to kind of sublimate those themes in my characters. I really wanted this just to be a coming of age and kind of a, uh, you know, progress report on the American dream and show how, how race and class can, can thwart expectation and opportunity. And, and um, but I really wanted it to be part of a bigger conversation about what are we going to do about this? Well, I think it's a good one because he's, um He's ground down by the kinds of things that we don't think about if we're not poor, that you may think that people like this are on social services, but they're not working all the time or trying to work all the time. Both he and his mother and the guy who rents their shed, which tells you something right Freddy. there, to, to live <laughs> a pretty interesting character. Um, that's what it's like to have zero control over your life because every day is just trying to scrap to pay to live. You don't have any discretionary income. You can't get ahead. There's not a way to do it. And he, Mike bumps into people who are living on the opposite end of that divide. Um, what informed your writing about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's true. I, I mean, I've run into it in my life. You know, I mean, I grew, I grew up and my, my dad kind of uh, affected a transfer from the Bay Area to Keyport in Washington and moved us to the semi-affluent community of Bainbridge Island. We didn't have a lot of money, and then my dad affected his retreat back to California oh from okay. domestic life and left my mom. And, and so, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I grew up around, not everybody had money, but a lot of kids had money. We had less than most, and like, I didn't ride the ski bus because, you know, it was too expensive. Just skiing in general was too expensive, and plus I was working. I started working in, uh, started working off the books when I was 11 years old, bussing tables for my sister, who was a waitress in Pioneer Square. Wow. And, um, I, I think there's a lot of decisions the working poor make that don't make sense to people. And like, I mean, you said it right off the bat. Like, people don't understand. Like, well, they don't have any money. Why do they smoke? You know what I mean? Because it doesn't make sense on the surface. Right. If you just look at it objectively. Well, you know, that's a $10 a day habit right there. No wonder you're broke. But, you know, I mean, a lot of people that are working poor, are just I mean, they're just clinically depressed. You know what I mean? And, and it's like the only stimulant. relief you can get, right? right? Yeah, so you do this that thing. cigarette between jobs or between shifts or, you know, I mean, it starts to look like a bargain at 10 bucks a day, you know? It's the only thing that makes you feel good. Totally. I, I think the book 
opens that up in a way I haven't really read before in, in quite that way. The book is also funny. I mean, it just I laughed out loud at various things that Mike thought or said or the way he reacted to things. Well, it so. had to be funny. It's just too <laughs> painful. Otherwise, it, yeah. it would be too painful, but, but you relate, and I think that's a wonderful thing that you can disappear into somebody's world that way. Now, let's talk about Fundamentals of Caring. This is a Netflix movie starring Paul Rudd based on one of your novels. How did that go? How, how is it to be the writer, and do you have to let go of the material, or do they let you help shape what's going on? You know, the the strategy I took on that was to let go. I mean, I vetted a few directors, and Rob won me over right away. I mean, A, he had a friend who had a neuromuscular disease, so he had a sort of personal connection to the story. B, I knew he was hilarious because he was the funniest writer Letterman ever had. And so um, at that point, once I decided this is the guy, I just... No, like no, no propriety here. I, I said, you know, this is your baby now. Run for it. If I can be a, of help, let me know. And he did. You know, I mean, at times I got to read all, every draft of the script, and he would ask me, like, uh, you know, off the off the page character motivations that he knew I could give him some insight and things like that. And so, and and because of this, because I wasn't, you know, because I have friends, like, if they their book become a movie, they'd be like, well, no, my my protagonist is thirty seven, and you made him <laughs> thirty four. I mean, there's just, the writers can be pretty precious as a species sometimes, but like for me, it was just hands off. This is free money, you know, and that's that's the best kind. Uh, yes, that is the best kind. Yeah. That's a really good kind. Um, this is your life, Harriet Chance, is another one that's been optioned for film, and I would imagine Lawn Boy will be as well. But I have to ask before we let you go. So you hung out in libraries. That may be one answer. How did you start writing when you were otherwise kind of scrapping around just trying to keep it together? I started in third grade because, you know, my family was sort of uh, imploding and uh, I was having problems in the classroom because I'm like bipolar manic. And, and my third grade teacher, Mrs. Hanford, God rest her soul, she's no longer with us, but uh, she made a writer out of me. She noticed that I had this interest and she let me basically sit in a corner all year long and just write, write, write and encouraged it. And then I published a children's story in fourth grade, you know. My God auspicious bless beginning. Teachers. Yeah, and then God nothing bless for teachers. 30 years. 500 rejections. <laughs> you were just building six up. Six novels. So yeah. that you had a font of, of, of talent to blow out there at the right time. Thank you, <laughs> Thank so, you much. so much. It was lovely me. to meet you. And I really good. think this is a, a cool book and an important book. Well, and I hope everybody will read it. All right, we um, want to tell you that Jonathan has a number of signing events for Lawn Boy, beginning with a launch party tonight at 6.30 at Bainbridge Artisan Resource Network on Bainbridge Island. You can find the complete list of local events on our website, and it's super fun to read in the book about the things that we've also seen around here, but you're going to love it. Still ahead, our pal Cisco Morris turns his green thumb to a plant that can be found all over the Northwest. He's here after a quick break. <laughs>